Okay, so uh, again, to get people up on the same speed, um, uh, we're going to kind of cover now the next, the basics of targeted mass spectrometry. I'm going to introduce Li uh, Lindsay Pino. Uh, Lindsay Pino is a senior graduate student. Uh, what year? <laughs> Starting my fifth year. Starting her, her fifth year. <laughs> um, and a, a lot of the stuff that I was presenting and kind of uh, highlighting some of the, the challenges and issues as far as signal calibration, batch-to-batch -batch reproducibility, et cetera, has worked as part of her, her thesis work. Um, uh, and what she's going to be presenting, at least now, is the basics of targeted mass spectrometry and some of the issues of the hardware and the application, how it actually works. Yeah. All right. So thanks for the introduction, Mike. Um, if at any point during uh, Mike's uh, opening lecture you were feeling a little lost, um, hopefully this will bring you up to speed with some of the words, some of the terms, and some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about all week. Uh, if you feel very comfortable with this material. I encourage you to interrupt and add in your own uh, pieces of, of wisdom for people who might be coming from different background uh, than a specifically mass spectrometry background. So there are three specific goals that I hope you walk away with um, having a good understanding for. Um, so the first is being able to assess some of the experimental pros and cons of a targeted proteomics experiment versus something like a discovery proteomics experiment. And we'll talk a little bit about what the differences are um, and when you might choose one over the other. Um, since this is a targeted proteomics course, we're going to focus mostly on the, the targeted proteomics aspects. Um, one of the second points that I hope you walk away with a better understanding um, is some of the fundamentals of mass spectrometry proteomics. If you're coming from an analytical chemistry background or a mass spectrometry background, hopefully this is a lot of review. Um, but if you're not, this is to kind of even the playing field and make sure everyone understands what we're talking about and we're all using the same vocabulary. Um, and then finally, we're going to go through some of the, the steps of doing a targeted proteomics workflow. Uh, something like I have, you know, a freezer box full of samples and I want to do mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry proteomics. What is my, my very first step of doing that? Or maybe you have peptides and you're ready to run a mass spectrometry experiment, but you're not sure sitting down in front of your instrument, what are the specific steps that I need to do? So we're going to start off um, talking about fundamentals of mass spectrometry proteomics. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, targeted mass spectrometry proteomics data acquisition. Um, we'll go over the experimental design, um, both some of kind of the sample prep uh, ideas and then focusing mostly on um, how to go from a protein of interest to a mass spectrometry assay. Uh, and then finally, we'll look a little bit uh, at the data itself. So we'll look a little bit about at spectra and at, uh, chromatograms, and then I'll talk briefly about assay validation. So overall, this should give you a little bit of a taste of, of some of the uh, things that we're going to be doing hands-on um, this afternoon. And just like Mike had mentioned, feel free to interrupt whether you have a question or a comment or just some general observation that you think would be helpful for the class. Um, this is definitely a community-based uh, platform. Skyline is definitely a community-based community platform. Um, so we want you guys to be able to learn from each other, not just from the instructors. So let's start with some of the fundamentals of mass spectrometry proteomics. Um, and right off the bat, uh, just trying to define what are what do we mean when we say targeted proteomics. And I think if you ask every person in this room, it probably is slightly different definition. Uh, to me, I think the most important things are that it's a, a mass spectrometry based analysis that focuses on just a subset of proteins. You know what proteins you want to measure right off the bat. If you don't know what proteins you want to measure, you're not doing targeted proteomics. Um, and then the final goal of a targeted proteomics experiment is almost always quantitation. Like we don't, we uh, are less interested in whether we detect something or not. We want to be able to quantify the abundances of the different proteins. Um, some uh, of the reasons people choose a targeted proteomics experiment is because it's highly reproducible um, and it's also highly sensitive. Quantitatively, it's very sensitive. Um, one of the reasons people uh, are maybe moving away from targeted proteomics or trying to do other types of mass spectrometry-based proteomics is because you're limited in the number of proteins. So this goes back to what Mike was saying this morning about how you can measure lots of things but not particularly well, or you can measure a few things extremely well. Um, so targeted proteomics is definitely balancing more on, on a subset being measured extremely well. Um, and it's kind of kind of balancing, you know, like choose two of three here. Um, so just like 
in our work life, if we had to choose between research progress, sleep, and work-life divide, choose two of the three. Um, it's similar with mass spectrometry mass spectrometry based proteomics. So you can have sensitive quantification, you can have a scalable assay, or you can have comprehensive peptide detection. Um, there's not really a good way of doing all three of these, so you have to choose your mass spectrometry method based on what your, your experimental question is. So on the left-hand side of this, if you wanted sensitive quantification and you wanted it to be scalable, um, a lot of samples, um, targeted proteomics, aka quantitative proteomics, is a good bet, um, where your goal is to quantify specific predefined proteins. Um, so the two types of mass spectrometry you'll hear related, uh, you'll hear um, mentioned along with this, is selected reaction monitoring, SRM, and parallel reaction monitoring, PRM. I'm going to be mentioning PRM a lot because I saw in your surveys that a lot of you have Orbitrap instruments, Q executives. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we, we maybe focus a little bit on what you'd be taking home back to your labs. On the other hand, if you wanted uh, to do a scalable and comprehensive peptide detection, that would be more of a discovery based um, where you could detect all of the proteins that might be present in a sample, um, but uh, you'd be using a method called data dependent acquisition. So on Thursday, we're going to be talking about not SRM, PRM, or DDA. We're going to be talking about data-independent acquisition on Thursday. And that's kind of been a new thing uh, that the field has been trying to do to reconcile sensitive quantification, scalable assays, and comprehensive peptide detection. So that's just a term to stick in the back of your mind that we'll be getting, we're turning back to is DIA and SWAF. So just as an overview, I mentioned you have, for example, all of these samples sitting in your freezer. Maybe, maybe these are tissue samples like heart, uh, maybe they're plasma, um, maybe they're cell uh, pellets um, from some perturbation or genetic experiment that you've done. Um, the very first step in a mass spectrometry workflow would be to, for example, homogenize those tissues, slice the cells, um, do some sort of subcellular fractionation if you're interested in some organelle inside a cell or, or some laser capture or microdissection if you're interested in a specific section of tissue. Um, and the goal there is to get proteins out of your sample. Once you have proteins from your sample, you might do another set of sample prep. You might fractionate the proteins. You might do a post-translational modification enrichment, um, like if you're interested in phosphorylation or signaling pathways, you might enrich for phospho. Um, you might do an immunoprecipitation. If you have a protein you're interested in and you know that it's a very low abundant protein, you might pull it out of all of the other proteins in your sample using antibodies. Enzymatic digestion, um, using some enzyme like trypsin or lyse C, or if you're really fancy, there's some more expensive options than lyse C, um, to take a large protein and digest it, break it into smaller pieces called peptides. And then typically we end up with a sample of peptides that are ready for mass spectrometry. You might at this stage do more enrichment. Maybe you do another PTM enrichment, or maybe you do... Um, uh, as cleanup, maybe your samples might be a little dirty, something like plasma might need cleanup. But at this stage, no matter what type of mass spectrometry proteomics you're doing, everything pretty much looks the same, whether you're doing a discovery-based or you're doing a targeted-based. You need to prep your samples um, into peptides for mass spectrometry. We won't be going into anything like native or top-down here. <clears throat> but now that you have peptides for mass spectrometry, now what happens? First is that the peptides are separated by liquid chromatography. Um, I didn't see in the survey anybody doing anything other than liquid chromatography coupled to their mass spectrometers, but if you are, we can chat more about that. Um, liquid chromatography is used to simplify this complex mixture of peptides um, before shooting it onto the mass spectrometer. Peptides are ionized off of the liquid chromatography column and then inside the mass spectrometer, um, we'll be going into all the specific details of this step down here. We analyze the peptides um, by colliding them and making fragments and then measuring the fragments. And then we get this type of data that we call a chromatogram. And we'll be going into all of these steps on the bottom in more detail um, starting right now. Before we move into the more detailed section on the bottom half of this slide, are there any questions so far or comments or not yet. Everyone's still on board. No one lost too badly yet. So let's talk about what's 
happening as the peptides are being analyzed by mass spectrometry. So if we were to zoom in on one of those, those cartoon pictures of a peptide, we would see something like this. There in a peptide, there's an N terminus and a C terminus of the peptide, just like the protein itself. And then each one of the individual amino acids, you can kind of think of as an individual piece of the peptide. There's information we already know. If we know the sequence of a peptide, we know its mass. We can assume a charge, for example, a charge state of two. This peptide, we can say, takes a char start charge state of two. What we measure in the mass spectrometer isn't actually mass, it's mass to charge, m over z. So you'll be seeing this term a lot. And what this means is we took the mass of the peptide and whatever charge that ionized peptide has taken, and then the m over z is the, the value that we'll be referring to whenever we, we uh, get into Skyline or talk about peptide properties. So we already know the mass to charge of this peptide, but the first thing, uh, the second thing that the mass spectrometer does is bombards this peptide with inert gases that forces the peptide to break apart. And the nice thing about peptides is that they break apart at very predictable places along the backbone of the peptide. So in between each of these balls, um, which are being used to represent the amino acids, the fragmentation will happen somewhere there. So here I'm showing you some example um, of where a peptide might have fragmented if I bombarded this peptide. If I fragment this peptide, I get two halves. Usually this fragmentation happens and only one break happens in the peptide backbone. So now I have two halves of that original peptide. One half is referred to as the B ion and the other half is referred to as the Y ion. So to go into a little bit more detail, looks a little something like this. So I'm showing you on the top here what's called the fragmentation ladder. So you might notice that going from the C terminus towards the N terminus, those are all Y ions, and they increment as we move each amino acid down the line. And then the complementary B ion is produced from the second half going from the N terminus towards the C terminus. So if I do one fragmentation event and I break the total peptide, the overall peptide, into two halves, I would get this B5 ion and this Y7 ion. So that's just one fragmentation event. What's actually happening inside the mass spectrometer is tons and tons of these fragmentation events are happening. So a second fragmentation event, maybe this peptide would break into two different pieces now I have a B, B9 ion and a Y3 ion. So you can imagine if this peptide, there's a thousand copies, a thousand uh, individual molecules of this peptide in a mass spectrometer, and I fragment it, it could have any number of these types of fragmentations. Um, so we get a population of different fragmentations. And that's what we're seeing when we look at a mass spectra. So mass spectra is showing the mass to charge of the fragment ions here, the fragment ions, so each of those collision events. Mass to charge on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the intensity of the signal. Um, you can a little bit think of this intensity as a proxy for how many of those fragmentation events happen. So if it's a higher value intensity, that uh, particular fragmentation event happened more frequently than a very low intensity fragmentation event. So this is what the mass spectra for this peptide might look like. So now we can go through and match those individual mass to charge values to which fragmentation event happened. So are there any questions so far? I'm gonna review this one more time slightly different way in case you learn differently. Everyone good so far? Any other comments? Those of you who are maybe a little bit more uh, uh, classically trained in mass spectrometry, probably realize there's a lot of other fragmentation events that happen. Here we're focusing on Bs and Ys because I saw a lot of people have uh, Orbitrap mass spectrometers, but there are other cool things you can do to get different types of ions that we're not going to go into too much here. If you're interested, you can ask your classmates because I'm sure they can uh, explain to you things like A and Z uh, and what might happen if you had a PTM um, and different types of collision energies. Um, for now, we're going to keep it Keep it solid here because B's and Y's are the most important things to know for this part. Okay, so what's happening actually inside this mass spectrometer? 
The mass spectrometers themselves are generally composed of the same parts of an instrument. The first part of the instrument isolates precursors, so isolates those peptides based on their mass to charge. So you would have to know in targeted proteomics what precursor mass to charge you're interested in. You program the mass spectrometer to isolate that specific precursor mass to charge. So here in the little uh, video uh, that Agilent has put out, um, they're showing from this population of different colored ions, all of these are precursors. Let's say we wanted to select just the green ion. So the first stage in your mass spectrometer, Q1, quad one, quadrupole one, will isolate the precursor mass to charge you're interested in. The next step in your mass spectrometer um, will perform the collision. So gases are bombarded in here um, and, and we break each of those ions into two pieces, the Bs and Ys, for example, right? And we have lots of different types of collision events happening. So now we have a mix of different mass to charge fragments. And then the last step in your mass spectrometer um, will detect what that mass to charge is, measure that mass to charge, and we'll start building that mass spectra, right? So here I've shown you kind of the, the overall ion optics of a triple quadrupole. So each of these steps, the precursor isolation, the fragmentation, and the measurement is happening in a quadrupole, and then they just stack three of those and call it a triple quadrupole. However, I saw a lot of you have these Q-exactive HFs, and the biggest difference there is just in how the fragments are analyzed on a triple quadrupole. Um, we have this, this uh, uh, electron multiplier in an orbitrap, all of those individual fragment ions are sent into an orbitrap and spun around a spindle. So the biggest difference between whether you're doing targeted proteomics on a triple quadrupole versus on something like a Q-exactive mm -hmm. on a triple quadrupole, you need to know that precursor mass to charge. On the orbitrap, you need to know that precursor mass to charge, and you program your instrument to isolate a specific precursor, precursor mass to charge, mm -hmm. and then you fragment it. So far, everything's the same. So the difference is in how you analyze those fragment mass to charges. On a triple quadrupole, you again have to program your instrument to specifically measure one of those mass to charges, one of those fragment mass to charges. On an orbitrap, you don't have to program, it'll measure all of that population of fragment mass to charges. So any questions so far on this part before we change gears again? No questions? Still doing pretty good? So that's Triple quadrupole, that's selected reaction monitoring, SRM, sometimes called multiple reaction monitoring, MRM, but we're going to stick with SRM for this class. We're going to call it SRM, where you need to know precursor mass to charge and fragment mass to charge for everything you want to measure. On the QE, we do parallel reaction monitoring, PRM, where we just need to know the precursor mass to charge, and then we measure all of the fragments in the mass spectrometer. So, so far, so good? All right. Each of those mass spectra that the instrument takes can be stacked across time to make a chromatogram. So the measurement that the mass spectrometer makes, that mass spectra, it will acquire many mass spectra over time. And if you stack these over time, um, which I'm showing kind of on the, the right-hand side of this, so you have the mass spectrum on the left, and then on the right, the mass spectra are stacked over time, which is kind of the Z dimension going back into the, into the slide. You get traces that are called chromatograms. So the chromatogram is no longer mass to charge on the x-axis. It's retention time on the x-axis and intensity on the y-axis. Because when we're making these measurements, each of those fragments are being produced at the same time, for example, in an orbitrap, we're measuring the whole population of fragment ions, we get these kind of pretty rainbow shapes in the intensity that reflects how abundant each of those fragments was. So we're good. So far, mass spectra and chromatograms. Any questions? Plowing forward? 
All right. So now we kind of have an appreciation for this full workflow. We're going to move on now to some of the, the targeted mass spectrometry proteomics experimental design. And I'm going to focus more on PRM with your Orbi traps, just because that seemed to be most popular. Um, most of the workflow is the same. Again, the only difference might be whether you need to know the fragment mass to charge or not. So if we go back to that overview of targeted mass spec proteomics, some of the pieces of information we're going to need in order to program our mass spectrometer. The first, we need a hypothesis. We need to know what proteins we're interested in. The second, which peptides are we going to use from those proteins? This will be that precursor mass to charge information we need. And then we can go to our mass spectrometer and say, here's the peptide I'm interested in, measure it. So I think a lot of people looked like came to this class because you had specific experimental questions that you wanted to investigate using mass spectrometry proteomics. So it sounds like a lot of you already kind of have a hypothesis. You already know um, from other data, maybe Western blots or maybe genetic pathway uh, analyses um, or maybe RNA data, transcriptomic data. You might have an idea of pathways or specific proteins um, that you're interested in. So the first step with that, and we'll be going into this more later too, would be to get the sequence of that protein. Um, the second step is to pick what peptides from that protein you're going to use. So here I'm showing you uh, the protein sequence for some protein pulled at random <laughs> that uh, contains all of the information from that first methionine to the, the last amino acid. Um, in this particular protein. So it's a fairly average size protein. Um, you may notice that some uh, of the letters are colored in blue. Some of the letters are colored in red. The red are all the Ks and Rs, all the lysines and arginines, because here we're assuming that the uh, enzyme we'll use for digestion is trypsin. Trypsin will cut this protein up in, uh, by every K and R. So all the K's and R's are colored in red. Those are all the tryptic sites. And now in blue are what the tryptic peptide would be. So the tryptic peptide here, um, I've only highlighted tryptic peptides that are between 8 and 25 amino acids. And this is, I have a slide on this a little later, this is just kind of a general rule of thumb that people have used um, for mass spec proteomics. Um, the Long story short, <laughs> no pun intended, is that shorter peptides are harder to specifically uh, measure. We can't tell if it's a short peptide, if that peptide came from this specific protein or some other protein. Peptides that are too long are very hard to make fly through your mass spectrometer, like those little, uh, little ions that we saw flying through the, the videos before. So I use this rule of thumb, 8 and 25 amino acids, tryptic peptides. And now your first job, if you wanted to measure this protein by mass spectrometry, would be to pick two to five unique peptides. Which ones should we pick? How do we pick them? Um, why does it matter? So I've taken all of those tryptic peptides here, and I've just ordered them by rank on the x-axis. Each of the bars is a specific peptide. And then on the y-axis is its response, its mass spectrometry response, MS response. So right off the bat, we notice that on the left, that particular peptide has extremely high MS response. It's a good responding peptide. On the right is very low responding peptides. So if we were to try to pick a peptide to use as a proxy for the protein we were just showing before, we'd want to pick something on the left side. We wouldn't want to pick transition, we wouldn't want to pick peptides that are, are on the right side of this. What does this mean to have a good MS response? So I just want to go back real quick to that mass vector I showed you before from our, our hypothetical fragment, uh, fragmentation slide. So if this were a mass spectra of a good peptide, it might look something like this. So Skyline lets you use what's called spectral libraries. You can get these from all over the place. We'll go into this more later, and we'll do some hands-on about this too. Um, but the spectral library is someone out there in the world has measured this peptide before, and this is what the mass spectra for this peptide looked like, for this peptide on 
some particular instrument. Instrumentation will vary a little bit. Um, we can talk about that later if you're if you're worried about it. Luckily, you all have Orbi traps, and there's a ton of data on Orbi traps. So, this is the mass spectra for this particular peptide, and this looks good. And the reason this looks good is because there's a lot of fragmentation over the full range. So, something that looks bad might look like this, where there's not a lot of fragmentation, and there's not a lot of fragments to use for this peptide. So just once more to build a little bit of intuition, good fragmentation, mass spectra for this peptide, bad fragmentation for this peptide. So that's what this is showing, whether it had good fragmentation or bad fragmentation. You want to pick a peptide that has good fragmentation. How do you know if any of those blue peptide options from our hypothetical protein is good or bad. Yeah, comment. So, so when you say good or bad peptides, uh, it might have right when you have this multiple fragmentation units happening in your sensitive view goes down for each fragment, but in the bad fragment, those two fragments could be fragmented. Absolutely correct. That's a great point. So, just to say it one more time in case you didn't catch it, maybe the total intensity of all of these peaks is kind of low compared to the total intensity of these peaks, the y-axis here, but this is still a better spectra than this spectra, even if that y-axis looks higher on the bad than the good. Does that make sense? Did everyone understand why that might be important? So if we just looked at total intensity, just looked at the y-axis, Maybe we could get a spectra where the y-axis is crazy high, but it's only like two fragments, versus this y-axis might be a little low, but we have lots of fragments. Yeah? Yeah, that's a good point. So it could be the case, so the, the comment was, it could be the case where even though this mass spectra looks not great, it's not very complete, there's not a lot of fragmentation across the range of mass to charge, it might be that the few fragments you do see are enough to selectively detect this particular peptide. Does anyone have a kind of intuition for which fragments might be the best? Um, the peptides that are above precursor mass. Do you want to explain a little bit why that is? Does that make sense? Everyone kind of follow? I'm seeing nodding heads. No, I'm sorry. I don't, don't follow. Don't follow. No, so, you guys, for some, some of the things that are being said, like you have to remember, there might be people that don't, like, I don't, what is precursor mass? Yeah. <laughs> what is, you know, I don't know, like, any of the sort of shorthand words. Yeah. Things. No, that's, that's a great question. So let's, if we look back at this hypothetical peptide, so this is just a peptide that digests off of the protein. So this is one of those blue. Precursor mass is one peptide before you fragment it. Sorry? Precursor mass is the mass of one peptide before you fragment it. Correct. Okay. Precursor is this, this peptide mass. So you might hear peptide, you might hear peptide sequence, you might hear precursor, you might hear parent. So all of those are kind of used synonymously for what this peptide is. Yeah, in the back. Mass to charge, correct. 
So it's not just the mass. Remember, the mass spectrometer, <laughs> kind of confusingly, doesn't measure the mass. It measures the mass to charge. It should be mass to charge geometer, I guess. Um, so even though this peptide, if we were to go through and add up each of the amino acids, we would get uh, like uh, 1,355 mass, but the spectrometer itself, the mass spectrometer itself, is measuring the mass to charge. So most peptides are charged two or higher, and it kind of depends on what amino acids are in, are in the peptide itself. We can get more into that if you're interested later. Um, but one important thing to remember is that if it's a peptide, it will have a charge two or higher. There's a lot of other things that just float around in the air or exist in uh, the solvents on your mass spectrometer that are contaminants. And they're almost always, like the comment in the back, charge one. So a lot of the stuff, there's like, like paint fumes, if they recently painted outside of your mass spectrometer room, um, if they're doing any work in the ceiling, like in the ducts, um, like ceiling tiles, uh, what's some other good ones? Uh, there was a story of a student in the Macas lab who was wearing Axe deodorant spray and had a contaminant every time he sat down at the instrument and blamed everyone except for his Axe. Um, so yeah, strong, any kind of uh, strong scent um, will show up like a contaminant, but it'll almost always be plus one. So if it's a plus two in a mass spec proteomics peptide sample, you can be pretty confident it's a peptide. And then we can get up to higher charge states depending on the, the peptide chemistry itself. So specific amino acids might add extra charge. Um, PTMs will add extra charges. Um, yes? Yeah. So if the, frag if the peptide begins at a plus two. So I didn't put it, sorry, I'm gonna go all the way back again. <laughs> I didn't put the charge in here, in here. However, if this started as a plus two, when we cut it in half, when we collide it and divide it in half, each of these will be charge one. So the mass to charge of these fragment ions in this particular example will be one. So the mass to charge will just Kind of, kind of be the mass. Um, there's some other hydrogens, and but it'll basically be the mass. Question. Uh, please comment about uh, the, the the two different kind of spectral libraries, whether which one is good and which one is yes. not good. Yes. So if I'm developing the targeted method, and <laughs> I have to choose my method, I have to define my transition. I will never be going to that second spectrum in which I, I get to see only one or two transitions, not the rest, because I'm not sure yeah. that whether that is actually coming from that subject or is it Going to the spectra. So this guy. Yeah. yeah. This is probably not one I would ever use if I had a choice of something else. Um, just because the best fragments to pick are typically the ones that cut the precursor about in the middle. So that means a Y1 is not useful because a Y1 is just going to be K or R because it's a triptych peptide. So what peptide did that come from? It's almost impossible to tell. If it's just a K or an R, all we can say is it was a triptych peptide. A Y2 is also not particularly useful because now it can be anything plus K or R, right? So the farther you go in to the fragmentation ladder for a precursor, the better and more selective those transitions are because there's no way combinatorics of amino acids could equal that particular mass. So it might be the case in one of these bad looking fragmentation spectra in a spectral library, it might be the case that it's a really solid, good transition right in the middle of the precursor you're interested in, in the middle of the peptide you're interested in. But commonly, you would want to use something like this. If you have a choice, from a bunch of peptides and your choice was this or this, I would probably prefer to use a fragmentation spectra like this. 
with lots of evenly spaced. So is that, is everyone still on board? Questions are definitely welcome. So still on board, so we've got Spectral Library. You can find Spectral Library online. Um, so this is less of a slide for you to specifically read each of these bullet points and more of a slide to reference later if you wanted to look for Spectral Libraries. Um, it could be really nice to use public repositories for Spectral Libraries um, instead of just diving headfirst into an experimental brute force approach. Um, some that I will, some of these repositories that I'll highlight um, because this is Skyline. Oh, question first. Sort of a general question. Are there tools or even in Skyline itself that will take some of this logic, logic that you just described and actually automate the selection of that? There are. And we will be doing that in the hands on. So that's a perfect setup for the hands on segment this afternoon. Um, it's not entirely automated, but you would you will probably be impressed how easy it can be to go from a protein to peptides that you have spectra for. Um, any more questions about this before I just do a couple little vignettes of specific repositories? So one um, that I'll plug, since this is McCoss Lab, is Passport. Um, so the website's up top there. The idea with Passport is that you can see some of the different response similar to that figure I had just showed you before for our hypothetical protein where we had some on the left of the graph we had some very high responding peptides and on the right of the graph we had very poor responding peptides so this might be a situation where if you are interested in aspartate amino transferase cytoplasmic 4 <laughs> um, if you were interested in this particular protein and you typed it in to Passport, you would see a page like this that would show you, look at all these great peptides on the left. You should definitely prioritize these peptides to measure this protein, and maybe don't waste your time trying to measure any of them on the right. Another uh, extremely thorough resource um, is the CPTAC assay portal. Um, so this uh, particular assay portal also includes um, additional information uh, that Mike had brought up. Um, like the limit of detection and the limit of quantitation. So these are peptides that not just respond well and fragment well, um, but they've also been thoroughly validated for their reproducibility, their accuracy, their precision. Um, however, oh, question, yep. A lot of these resources have options where you can plug in exact experimental parameters, like specific instrument you're using, fragmentation that you're using. Um, so some of these contain all that information. You can typically, a lot of these resources, you can plug all that in and pull all that information specific for your experimental parameters. So the question uh, was talking about CID, HCD, ETD. These are different ways to fragment. I had generalized how collision happens, um, but there are some specific uh, ways you can do fragmentation that changes what that uh, peptide fragmentation pattern looks like. Um, so the question was just, that seems like an important parameter. Do these take that into an account? And they do. Um, so. Although these, oh, one more question, yes. I've been told, I don't do a lot of work with um, spectral libraries, but my friends who do have told me that the Pan Human Library is really good. They get good results off of that. It's a very large library, but anybody have favorite spectral library resources? Maybe people who do more. Spectral library searching, database searching. Yeah? Uh, do they have libraries for DIA experiments? We are starting to build libraries now for DIA experiments, yes. <laughs> um, so far, I don't know too many repositories that exist. Um, luckily, Rudy is here. There is uh, what's being called the NCI 60, um, which is supposed to be a good deep dive spectral library um, for DIA. Um, we will have a full day on Thursday talking just about DIA. Uh, 
Any other favorite spectral library repositories? I typically collect my own spectral libraries <laughs> when I need to. However, there are frequently experiments where there is no good spectral library that exists, maybe because this is research, you are the first person to be asking this question or the first person to be looking at this protein. Um, so Skyline allows you to source peptide targets from thin air in silico just based on the protein sequence. So these will be going into more details in the hands-on, but I wanted to kind of give you a taste for what we'll be doing. In Skyline, there is um, a parameter called the peptide settings, and this performs what's called in silico protein digest. So based on parameters that you set in these windows, Skyline will take a peptide sequence and chop it up just like I showed you in that, that slide picture with the red um, triptych amino acids, the red Ks and Rs, and then the blue um, amino acids if they're of a certain length. So the settings are very crucial in here and we'll be playing around with this later. In all of the Skyline um, hands-on sections, I encourage you to try to go rogue um, and maybe try how different settings will change what Skyline shows you. Um, this is the best place to go rogue like that because the instructors know how to get you back <laughs> on track if things go south. <laughs> but all these settings are crucial because if you are having to source peptide targets just from a protein sequence, um, there are some general rules of thumb. They are extensive and a little bit like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Sometimes they work perfect and sometimes they just slide off. Um, this again is a slide, not for you to read each bullet point right now, but to use as a reference later. So that kind of got into selecting the peptide parameters, the precursor and the fragment parameters, but we didn't really talk too much about liquid chromatography. I'm going to go through this section pretty quick just in case um, anybody has questions about how liquid chromatography is going to affect all of their mass spectrometry business. Um, so this will be a little bit fast just so that we can cover everything. Um, if you feel lost, you can bug me during lunch or yell at me later. <laughs> so the chromatography that you set up has consequences. Um, these consequences are broadly called points across the peak. So points across the peak, when we draw these chromatograms, um, each of the horizontal lines is representing one scan. So that's one mass spectra that I've slid on its side and stacked up over time to build this chromatogram. So depending on how many mass spectra you have, how many MS, MS scans you have to stack, you get better or worse estimate of that peak shape. So if we take away this interpolated blue line, really the data we have from these MS-MS spectra that we've stacked across time is just these points. So intensity on the Y and time on the X. Orientation feel okay? Maybe? Seeing a couple people confused, I'll show a couple more examples, then maybe we'll regroup. So this is the just showing the same thing again, and I just want to emphasize how when we take away the interpolated chromatogram, the interpolated, interpolated blue line that we've kind of drawn in, it's hard to tell just from these points what the original peak shape was. We don't have enough points across the peak to really describe what the peak shape was. So this can be very important because we're using the integrated area under those peaks as our quantitative values. So the better we can draw what the peak shape is, the better quantitation we're gonna have. One parameter in this is how fast your mass spectrometer is. So we'll call this cycle time, the time in between each of the MS, MS scans, each of the, the mass spectra that we've collected for this mass to charge. If we collect infinite scans across the peak, we'd have a perfect picture, but our instruments currently have limitations where they can't take infinite scans per second. Um, so we have to get creative in how we can program our mass spectrometer to collect as many scans as possible, as many points across the peak as possible. Um, this is kind of a reference slide. Uh, if this is of interest to you, if you maybe have not great peak shapes or if you're interested in getting great peak shapes, um, this is a great paper from 
goodness, a decade ago, um, that kind of shows you how different parameters on your mass spectrometer, um, which are the different colors and points, can change uh, what your uh, view of the peak shape is. So the three things you need to balance in order to get good points across the peak are the target list, how many things you're trying to measure. This is for PRM, this is the number of precursors in your list. In SRM, on a triple quadrupole, this is the number of transitions. So remember, PRM on our orbit traps, we're just stuffing all of the fragments and measuring all of them. On a triple quadrupole for SRM, we have to do each one, one at a time. So the target list, what's called the dwell time, and then finally the total acquisition time. So target list, the number of precursors or transitions, depending on what your instrument is, um, the acquisition time, the total length of the mass spec experiment you're doing, and then the dwell time, the amount of time we're going to spend collecting each of those scans. So these are parameters that if you have a facility, um, you can ask them about how they're collecting um, for their method, uh, or if you are lucky enough to sit down and, and work it out yourself, um, these are what you could be playing with in your method editor. Just to kind of bring this back around, um, the target list and the dwell time combine to create the cycle time. How long you're going to take on each scan and how big your target list multiplied together creates your cycle time. Just to give you a little bit of intuition for those spacings. So cycle time, just the spacing in between those MSMS -MS scans. Okay, so the liquid chromatography gradient itself um, is composed of a couple pieces of information. One is the starting condition, the duration of the separation, and then the start and end, what I'm saying is percent B. So this is the amount of organic solvent you're flowing through. We're not going to really get into the specifics of liquid chromatography in the interest of time, but if you're into separations, we've got some separations people in the audience. This is a typical picture um, of a typical visualization of a liquid chromatography gradient. So on the x-axis is the time of the gradient. So this total method is about a 35-minute method, 35-minute acquisition. So that was one of the sides of that triangle. 35 is pretty short. <laughs> so I think more typical um, that I've seen is more like an hour. Um, on the y-axis here is the amount of organic. Peptides tend to like to elute at around 10% to 35 or 40%. Um, typically, I say, some peptides like to elute very early, and some peptides like to elute very late. So this is kind of an experimental parameter that you'll have to determine. The real high jump up in organic is the wash. This flat part here re-equilibrates the column. The column has to be brought to uh, starting conditions. And this part at the beginning is a separation where the peptides are going to a loop. Question? Uh, why would you re-equilibrate Because this particular method was taken from an instrument, uh, a liquid chromatography system that has its own re-equilibration built in. For other instruments that don't have re-equilibration built in, you would bring this all the way back down. Yeah? The re-equilibration? The little isotonic? Probably, yeah. Yeah, this was more, more for um, illustration purposes, but yeah. So the, the important reason I bring up liquid chromatography is because of retention time. So all the peptides are going to elute off of the liquid chromatography column and into the mass spectrometer um, at specific times. So this is showing three just cartoon peptides, a blue peptide, a green peptide, and a red peptide. The blue one elutes first. It's the earliest on the time dimension. And the red one elutes latest. If I were to do a targeted acquisition of these three precursors, each one of my horizontal gray MSMS -MS scans is going to be looking at one of these three. 
So my first MSMS scan might be blue, my next MSMS scan is measuring green, my third is measuring red, and then I just keep looping back around these three. So MSMS scans, three peptides, just gonna loop through sequentially over the three of them. If I were to look then at where the points on the peak are, you might notice, my projector's a little, little dark, that I don't have many points across these peaks because I'm spending so much time cycling through all of these three. I'm wasting time at the beginning when only my blue peptide is eluding off of the column. I'm wasting time looking for that red peptide. Without changing the cycle time, all of my gray bars are still stacked equal distance. I haven't changed my cycle time. We can do something called scheduling. And instead of cycling between blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, I can spend all of the scans at the beginning of my mass spectrometry experiment only scanning blue, and then only scan green, and then only scan red. This is called scheduling. So this is a way to increase the points across your peak without changing anything else is by doing scheduling. There are some pros and cons of unscheduled versus scheduled methods. Um, unscheduled methods, when you just cycle blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, um, are easy because they're set in and forget it. Um, when you do a scheduled method, you might need to watch more closely and make sure that the peptides are always eluding at the same time or else you won't be collecting. Unscheduled, you're not able to uh, have as big a target list, but if you schedule, you can fit more targets into the exact same method. And then finally, unscheduled, you might end up with less points across the peak on average, just because you've wasted all of those other uh, mass spectrometry scans on peptides that aren't even eluding. Um, so overall, unscheduled is easier, but you do get a lot of quantitative benefits from doing scheduling. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong on this, but if I wanted to ever do a scheduled method, it kind of seems like I have to do an unscheduled method yes. a few times just to yep. make sure that... That is 100% the workflow for doing a scheduled method, yeah. Any more questions? Because this brings us just about to the last section before lunch, and this will be pretty quick because most of this we're going to be doing hands-on later. All right. Okay, so now you have data. Now what? <laughs> the story doesn't end. Um, the, uh, the last step typically in one of these processes is to manually curate your data. Um, so there's a couple criteria for when you're looking at a chromatogram um, to determine whether or not it's good. Uh, the first is called coelution. So this is all of those fragment MZ should be stacked up like a beautiful rainbow. The second is peak shape should be symmetrical. Sometimes you get bad peak shapes and that's not ideal. And then the third is, is just kind of generally signal intensity. If it's very, very low y-axis, um, typically those, those data suffer from 0.1 or 0.2 as well as being low intensity. There's some additional parameters that you could use if you happen to have this information. Uh, the uh, fourth uh, thing to look for is called the correlation to the library spectrum. So Skyline will calculate this for you um, into a value uh, called the dot product, dot p. Um, this will just say the spectra that was collected versus my library reference spectra, do they look the same? And if they don't, it's probably not the right peptide. The fifth is the correlation to retention time. So if you've done, for example, scheduling, you've done this, this run, you know around the right time your peptide should elute. If you know your peptide elutes at minute 30, but in your data it looks like it eluted at minute 60, it's probably not correct. And then the last one, um, if you happen to have heavy isotope standards, you can make sure that the um, light and heavy peptide standard, the light and heavy peptides are eluding together. So just to show you a couple of examples before we break for lunch, um, I mentioned that correct chromatogram should be symmetric. So this beautiful rainbow, this is a PRM, so we've got all of the different fragments for this precursor. Um, they're all stacked on top of each other in this, this pretty rainbow. Um, on the other hand, where is my peptide? Um, so not all data looks like a beautiful rainbow. A lot of data looks more like this, where it's really hard to tell which 
peptide might be it because I can see a couple possibilities in here that kind of look like rainbows. So this is where it would be helpful to have a library reference and have a dot product. Um, there's uh, things called interferences. So this can be like the, those singly charged chemicals that happen to come through um, just from your Axe body spray or whatever. Um, these are fragments that aren't ideal because you can kind of see where the rainbow is and then there's kind of like this weird humpy bit coming out at the beginning or the end. Skyline is really good at picking most of these for you right out of the data especially when it looks clean like this, like this pretty rainbow. Um, but there are times where Skyline can struggle just because there's a lot of pretty looking rainbows and it's kind of up to you as the researcher to manually curate which one is correct or not. So Mike mentioned, um, and we'll be going into more of this tomorrow with signal calibration, not only do you want to check and make sure that the rainbows are pretty, the chromatograms look pretty, um, but other tests you might want to do are, are assay validation. So you mentioned the linearity. If I made a dilution of my peptide, is it linear? Um, Mike mentioned uh, things like reproducibility. If I measure the same sample three times, do I get the same chromatographic uh, shape out of it? And then finally, there's some level on our instruments where we can't measure any lower signal intensity. This is the noise. And right above the noise, where the linear uh, range ends, would be the lower limit of quantitation. And just to kind of give you a feel, here's a peptide from yeast. Uh, here's a protein from yeast that I've drawn gray boxes for all the peptides I detected. Here are two peptides that both had great chromatograms. On the left, I'm showing you that the dilution where the green line, the noise, and the linear range intersect is a lot higher on the x-axis as compared to the peptide that's on the right. So if you look at, I've kind of drawn this purple line um, where the intersection is, the x-axis are the same on these two peptides, and I'm showing you that the peptide on the left has a smaller linear range than the peptide on the right. So if I were to pick between these two peptides, I would want to do my quantitation on the peptide on the right because it has a longer linear range, longer dynamic range. So we'll be getting more into these later. I just wanted to expose you to some of the ideas and words that you're going to be hearing about. So I'll be around for lunch if you have any questions.